You ready? Okay. So I can just. Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Today is Thursday, April 27th, 2017. May I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Mrs. Starr? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Mr. Vashon? Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we do have some adjustments to the agenda tonight. Um, this was originally scheduled as a workshop meeting, and in workshop meetings we don't typically have public comment, but we are having public comment tonight, so that um, has been added to the agenda as 5.0. New business has been changed to agenda item 6.0. Executive session has been changed to agenda item 7.0 and adjournment has been changed to agenda item 8.0. So with that, that takes us right up to public comment on agenda items. And um, you have three minutes to speak on any of the topics that are on the agenda. Um, please state your name and address, but also um, tonight we have a, a notebook up there. If you could write your name and street address because we need that for the minutes and for the record and it's sometimes hard to pick up on the recording later. So if you could just sign in that would be great. And there are lights counting down to let you know when your time is running up and let's go. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tor Nelson. I live on Morning Street. Uh, last month, uh, the board voted to move the start time of the high school day to 8.50 with an end time of 3.15. This decision not only impacts the 1,100 high school students, but also impacts the remaining 2,000 students in the district. The ripple effect of this grows wider as it then impacts each of their families. This also impacts the personal lives of the teachers and staff who are affected by the shift in start and end times. Of the 24 schools in Southern Maine, seven have start times of 8 o'clock or later, with three of those seven starting at 8.30. Of those seven schools, ending times vary between 2.30 and 2.45. Currently, seven schools start earlier than Scarborough High School's start time of 7.35. If the new schedule is finally adopted, Scarborough High School would have the latest start time and end time of any high school in Cumberland or York County, and possibly in the state. As an aside, what happens with AM Volk students who drive to school at 7 a.m. and catch the 725 bus to Paths or to Westbrook? If they are allowed to come in early, then I would argue that your premise for an early start time has been compromised, though I believe that those students should continue with AM Volk. I would also argue that a one-size-fits-all approach will not work and that a more creative solution needs to be investigated. The positives and the negatives are listed on startschoollater.net. Research is out there without question that indicates that teenagers need more quality sleep. Research also says that the argument against the later start time at no time mentions the education of students. Having read the research along with a survey sent out by central office, I would argue, however, that a student's education takes place not only in the classroom but also on the playing field, at a part-time job, at play practice, at activities, with family and with homework. By removing an hour and 15 minutes from the student's day, any or all of those after-school opportunities will be impacted. Regarding teachers, the expectation of the administration and the school board is that teachers will always be on top of their game, in addition to always working to get better at what they do. I believe that teachers expect that of themselves as well. And while that is difficult enough, keep in mind that teachers are involved with NEASC accreditation, preparing for a new 4x4 block scheduling format a new approach with proficiency-based education, and a dramatic shift in start end times throughout the district. My heart goes out to each of them trying to be on top of their game. This time shift will diminish opportunities for taking professional recertification classes or courses toward an advanced degree. It would also diminish the teacher's ability to balance their own family time with the need to review the lessons that took place that day or preparation for the next day. In 2013, I retired after a 43-year career, 43 career in education as a teacher, assistant principal, athletic director, <laughs> class advisor, um, coach, 
student council advisor. A year later, I returned as a building ed tech at Scarborough High School working on building safety and security and assisting with daily attendance. In my ed tech position, I would see the same handful of students each morning as I opened <coughs> the building at 6.30. Over the next hour, I would see another group of students coming in at the same time each morning, either by private transportation or by bus. And lastly, I would see the remaining students coming in late for school. Most were occasionally late, while some others were habitually late. And of those who were habitually, habitual offenders, late start Wednesdays made little difference to, to them arriving to school on time. Like many adults, teenagers, creatures of habit. Almost done. And in my position at, as building ed tech, I had the opportunity to be in the halls. While I observed the occasional frequent flyer, I also got to walk by classrooms where teachers and students were on task. Scarborough schools have a reputation of being among the best in the state. When I pay my property tax every six month, a month, I am fine with it, knowing that money is being well spent. Lastly, while I support the school department and thank the school board for serving the community, I truly do, believe me, uh, I ask you to please reconsider a compromise that does not exceed the recommendations found in research nor the late start times of neighboring schools. I agree with Thomas Vachon and with Jackie Perry in their comments last meeting. In my opinion, it is too much too soon. I will close by echoing Claire Merrill, a current sophomore who spoke earlier this month. She is involved with everything Scarborough High School has to offer with her eyes on the future. Please do not disrupt those opportunities for her or for anyone else. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, but can I just, um, we have a long meeting ahead of us with an executive session after, so we really do need to keep it fair for everyone, so three minutes, please. Uh, my name is Kirsten Denner, and I live on Forley Lane, um, and you heard from me last time, so last meeting. Could you come and a little closer to the microphone, because the um, recording won't be able to hear you. Um, and last time I talked about all the reasons why you shouldn't change the start time, but Today I'm going to talk about something along the same lines, but um, yeah. So you are probably all looking at me thinking, what is this kid saying, you know, who does she think she is? But I want to remind you that I'm not going to be a kid for much longer. Um, <laughs> you know, in a year I'll be 18 and I'll be able to vote. And I think all of you, with the exception of the superintendent being elected officials, I think that you understand that it's your responsibility to, to, vote, you know, to vote in the way that the people want you to. It's your responsibility to listen to us and to do really what we want. Um, and I feel that you're not doing that. The vast majority of the people in this town do not want you to change the time. And I'm not, I don't understand quite why you continue to ignore that and vote to change it. I don't understand. I'm not going to pretend to understand why you push a different agenda than what we want. But, um, so when you ignore us, what kind of message does that send to me as an impressionable, impressionable kid that tells me that you don't care, that you don't care what we want, that you don't care our struggles? But, you know, you're telling me that no matter how hard I try and no matter how hard, how much I speak to you and, like, beg you to not change this, that you're not going to listen to me. And that's very, very frustrating. Um, you know, when I go to vote in November of 2018, I want to know that I'm going to be voting for people that are going to listen to me and listen to all the people here that don't want you to change this. I want to know that I'm represented. I want to know that you guys are going to listen and do what this town wants. And I don't know if that's not going to happen. You know, it's kind of concerning to me. So I ask you to represent the people, and I ask you to, to please, you know, listen to us. And if it's something different from what I'm saying, what we want, then vote that way. But please listen to us and please vote in the way that we want you to. Because ultimately, that's your job. So, um, so what I ask of you is this. When I go to vote for the first time in November 2018, and I'm thinking about who's going to represent me and who's going to represent the people and what we want instead of pushing their own personal agenda, can I include you on that list? Thank you. Thank you. My name is April Sider, and I live at 14 Bentley Drive. Um, I speak on behalf of my husband and I, who have been in such 
contact with the board that we are, we first want to express our gratitude um, specifically to so many of you who answered our individual questions and our emails and sat down and met with my husband for an hour and a half. Um, we are very deeply invested in this and invested in this community and um, so I do same. I, I want to just express our appreciation first and foremost. Uh, it's no secret that Matt and I are both opposed to the proposed option three start time change. Um, we think that the option of uh, is it, which includes starting the kids, the primary school children at 8 a.m. is just too early. Um, we support the research and the science that goes along with the high school start times needing a shift. Um, one of our biggest points of contention, however, is that many of these studies do show um, that there can be an increase in sometimes significant benefit to the duration of teen sleep with as little as a 30-minute time change to the schedule. And we've been told repeatedly that that's just not the case and, and the science doesn't support that. Um, one thing I would like to point out is that a lot of the studies done and cited by uh, Start School Later and the board were conducted in places like Minneapolis and California who don't get as early of a sunrise as we do on the East Coast. And so in some ways, 8 o'clock is an arbitrary time. 9 o'clock is an arbitrary time. What we're talking about is circadian rhythms. What we're talking about is brain chemistry and biology. <coughs> and all of these things should be dictated by the science. And the science is the sun rises earlier in the East Coast than it does in Minneapolis. 30 minutes earlier, actually. And so as time changed, as little as 30 minutes for these high school kids could have a significant impact. Uh, other successful districts, such as Yarmouth, um, have implemented a uh, time change that is similar to option two. Uh, they did so with extensive community involvement, as I'm sure you know. Um, we actually spoke with the superintendent, who is the former superintendent for Scarborough. Um, and ultimately, they are very happy with their decision to move forward with something that um, I would consider to be close to option two. So here we are, making one last plea to listen and to be compassionate to the parents who are not in support of option three. Um, we appreciate your time and your consideration. Thank you. Hi, I'm Taylor Banks and I'm a junior at Scarborough High School. Um, I've read the articles that you guys have posted on the websites and I've read into this. Um, it's kind of been the talk of the school the past couple of weeks. Every time I walk into a classroom, I hear something about how despite the later time, they're just going to go to bed later. So I took the time to represent the students at Scarborough High School because you know a lot of them can't be here because of sports and I decided to do my own research um, to support what I have to say. So, morning fatigue is the body's natural thing in the body where your body is tired and has less energy. This applies to anyone no matter the age. It's shown that 25% of kids have fallen asleep in school at one point in their life and you guys mentioned this. I think it's normal that one day out of 12 years of school that you're allowed to feel that tired and guess what? The National Center for Health Statistics released in 2015 that adults over 20 had a 37.9% chance of falling asleep. So they're even more of a risk. Um, you also wrote about, um, we're quoting big academies, one being the American Air Force Academy. And I think it's a little extreme to compare Scarborough High School to that. And let me tell you, I have 99 <coughs> in my first period class that starts at 735. It's also biologically proven that teens feel more naturally awake at night. This is because of the melatonin levels in the saliva, which rise differently than those of adults. This is why, naturally, we're just going to go to bed later, because we feel more awake at night. Also, sports. This would affect 55.5% of high school students. There seems to be a disconnect between the people who make the decisions and the athletes who actually play the sports. 
Hockey already goes to 11 p.m. What is it going to go to next year if we start this late? With school ending at 3.15, students will miss essential family time and dinner time. Another thing mentioned was falling asleep at the wheel. Personally, I drive to school and I would never get in my car if I was that tired. We are educated on these deadly choices. It was actually shown that adults in their 30s had a 71% chance of falling asleep at the wheel, so more than us at the time. It's also shown that once you get out of college and start your normal job, that you start at 7.01 to 8 o'clock, depending on the city that you live in. Starting school later is just going to get our brains into that um, unhealthy cycle, so that when we're ready to go into the real world, it will be so difficult for us. I plan to be successful with the way things are now, and without the change, I think it will get me there. And lastly, work. Low-income families around the country are forced to make their children work so that they can bring in money or pay for important things like insurance. The normal teen goes to work right after school, like me. Right after school, 2.30, I get ready for work, and I get there. And the later that we stay in school, the later we can get to work, and that just changes up um, availability. My dad is also a teacher at Scarborough High School, so not only does this affect me, but it affects our whole family. He's working at his second job as we speak and works there till about 8 o'clock at night to bring in extra money just for food, bills, and everything else. Not only would this affect me negatively, it would affect my family and the high school students at Scarborough High School, so I please ask you to reconsider your decision. Thank you. We see the countdown, oh, yeah. but I think it's supposed to be turned around. <laughs> it just occurred to me. No, the the clock thing. I think we're not supposed to see it. I think <laughs> you're supposed to see it. It just it didn't. I didn't notice it till right now. That was different. Superintendent Kuchenberger, is there a way you can hand the person behind her that pad so they can write down the information so that they're not standing at the podium doing it? Yeah. Might Good. make things move. Good idea. Thank you. Um, just I'm Jennifer Jubilis, and I live at 16 Haystack Circle. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again today, um, and thanks to the school board for all of the hard work you've put into this debate. As a pediatrician and a kindergarten parent, I remain extremely concerned about early primary school start times. My daughter's work day out of the house begins when she meets the bus at 8.30 a.m. We are fortunate my husband has a flexible morning schedule. We don't need pre-care. But she then has a full day of kindergarten and aftercare, and her day ends when I pick her up from work around 6 p.m. This is a total of nine and a half hours of school and activity. As a pediatrician and mom, I have always been concerned that this day is too long. And proposed changes will only make her day an hour longer, ten and a half hours out of the house, Monday through Friday, for a six-year-old. Much has been made about this time change being beneficial to young students, but I challenge anyone to explain to me how this long of a day is beneficial, particularly in a time when primary school is more academic and structured. I fear, fear even more for families dealing with ADHD, learning challenges, or behavior and developmental challenges, as long days and less sleep for these children will make these challenges even more pronounced. While I respect the experience of school board members in early education and their belief in early start times for young children, I also have over a decade of pediatric clinical experience under my belt. I agree that for young children, opt optimal learning times probably are in the morning. But data for late starts for times for our adolescents, like all data, has its flaws, and there is no data for start times for the young child. What that means is we don't know if 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. is most appropriate particularly in the absence of data and within constraints such as long days such as the ones I have described. In my professional opinion, these long days are most definitely not beneficial and will negate any perceived benefits of an early start time for younger students. Much discussion was had at the last school board meeting about how to help families with this change, and I've looked at this particular problem of long days from every possible angle, and I don't see any way to mitigate this for our youngest students, short of making primary times late, later than 8 a.m. I know the current proposal will require fewer families to use pre-care and more will use aftercare. My question to the school board is how many families use pre-care currently? How many are like my family and just use aftercare with this decision just lengthening our child's day? Based on my current circle of professional friends and acquaintances, I would argue that more families fall into the latter category, and this is a large number of children that we may potentially be harming. 
None of us want to see our adolescents suffer. All of us would like to do what is best for our children. The vast majority of us are in favor of more compromise, at least until more data surfaces about optimal start times for early education. One of my medical school professors used to tell me, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Option two is good. More compromise is good. Not perfect, but perhaps the best of several difficult options. A colleague in pediatrics recently described to me that she feels our families are being left behind by the school board in this decision, and I urge you, again, not to leave the youngest students behind and figure out a way for primary start times to be later than 8 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pete Ammon. I'm a family practice doctor here at Scarborough. I live at 42 Clearwater. I have four children in the school system. And I'm uh, here to talk in favor of changing the school start time to later for the high school kids and the adolescent kids. Um, there's a quote from the director of sleep medicine from the Children's Medical Hospital in Washington, D.C. And she says, if you knew that in your child's school there was a toxic substance that reduced the capacity to learn, increased his chances of a car crash, and made it likely that 20 years from now he would be obese and suffer from hypertension, you'd do everything possible to get rid of that substance and not worry about cost. Early start times are toxic. Change is hard. Giving up uh, smoking is hard for people. Uh, we went through a lot of changes in the past decades, giving up smoking in public places, at beaches, at schools. Um, in the 70s, we gave up lead paint. All these things, you know, all these initiatives we have in Maine and throughout the country are hard, but we're doing this change. We're starting schools later for the health of our kids. It's not for convenience. It's not for daycare. Um, it's not for the uh, benefit of anyone in particular. It's for the kids. So we know that the children in high school and middle school who start schools later get more sleep. We know they have a decreased risk of injury on the sports field. We know they have less risk of depression. We know they have less risk, of, less risk of obesity. These kids are less likely to be involved in drinking, in substance abuse, and other uh, activities that they would do after school if they had more time. There's great amount of data to support the benefits of starting school later. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, is represented by 64,000 pediatricians in the country. Um, in 2014, they had a position statement which they spent five years working on, suggesting that the later school start times of 8.30 or 9 are preferable for the children. Um, this is about their health. This is not about convenience. Um, so for all these reasons, this is a hard decision to make, but other school systems in this, in this district and in this, in this area have done it, and they have done it successfully. I have patients that are teachers and patients that are students down in Saco or at Thornton Academy. And, and from first-hand knowledge, they have done a great job, and all of them are, are doing a better job at school. They're learning better, um, and they're, uh, they've acclimated to this new schedule without any issues. So for these reasons, I would encourage the board to follow through with what they should be doing and starting school leaders for the kids in middle and high school. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Andy Blaisdell. I live at Five Farmhouse Road, and uh, I have uh, two. Next year, I'll have two daughters in the in the school system. They're back there. Uh, they'll be in kindergarten and second grade at Pleasant Hill. So, I've got a ways to go through the school system. Um, I guess I wanted to start off by saying that I think option two is a good change. Um, I think that I've always thought that 7:30 is too early for the high school to start, mm -hmm. but I think that. 8:50 and 9 o'clock for uh, for uh, the middle school and high school is is extreme. I, I wanted to bring up four points. Um, the first one is uh, the board is uh, elected com community officials, and uh, as far as and also volunteers. And I appreciate what it takes to be a volunteer and take uh, a lot of time out of your uh, otherwise busy lives. Um, the uh, my take on the purpose of an elected official is to act in the best interest of the town. Um, seems that uh, this issue has been approached very much more from an interpretation of science and research. And uh, you know, I, I'm an engineer, and uh, I spend my day interpreting data and, uh, and theories and having to work with all that. And, and I have to say that 
I never considered that I was voting for uh, members of the Board of Education based on their interpretation of data and theories. Um, you know, I think that it really, there really needs to be a focus on what the town wants. Second point is, uh, what data do we have from the schools that have made this change uh, to 8.30, never mind 8.50 or 9 o'clock, but it's 8.30 uh, showing that there's been a dramatic improvement in the students' performance. Um, or, you know, maybe this, this really aggressive change, the most aggressive change so far in the state, or at least one of them, uh, is purely based on research. Without data showing improvement, it uh, seems premature to rush into such a major change. Uh, number three, uh, it's, it's been stated that the majority of uh, Scarborough residents are not opposed to uh, a change to option three. Um, you know, I, what I've seen is that maybe 50% are okay with it. And I think based on what I've seen in the room so far and everything I've heard, um, you know, if you ask, are you in favor of option three, uh, the majority would not be in favor. And uh, the fourth point is, uh, you know, just why should we make a change as big as option three uh, so fast? Uh, change can be good, and I think a change to option two is good, um, but you know the proposed change makes us the latest start time in the state. It's going to cause problems with uh, after-school extracurricular activities and uh, the ability of students to work after school and uh, and all those things. So, question is, do we call that being innovators or do we call that being guinea pigs? Uh, I don't think Scarborough should be guinea pigs. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm Krista Nilsen of uh, Morning Street in Scarborough. Uh, full disclosure, I am a staff member at the high school. I am not here in that capacity. I am here as a resident who may start a family here. Um, and I am also here as a uh, mental health professional. Um, I am currently pursuing my master's degree at USM in the mental health counseling program. And I will graduate as a clinical mental health counselor. So mental health is extremely complicated, right? There's no one size fits all fix for everybody. Um, I've spent the past 2.5 years studying mental health at USM. Um, I, I believe that change is a fact of life. Uh, change is inevitable. Many journal articles that I've read over the past two and a half years uh, have been published across several disciplines about the psychological and physiological effects of several changes occurring at once in organizations, whether they're schools, businesses, et cetera. When individuals deal with large amounts of change and uncertainty, they are more likely to experience anxiety, display irritability, lose sleep, and lose focus on daily activities. Essentially, with great change, comes great stress. Whether that change is good or bad, there is stress associated with it. The proposed change in time has drastic ripple effects throughout the community in every aspect of our lives as community members. Personal, professional, family, social, and physical health of our students, parents, community members, and teachers. We are implementing several changes at the high school level this year. These are all major important changes that will help with students' education. That said, when teachers are managing change and uncertainty in potentially all aspects of their lives that are affected by this time change, they are depleted. When teachers are depleted, they are not at their best. And when teachers are not at their best to serve their students, we are really doing a tremendous disservice to the kids that we are really, as I've heard everybody say, we're very concerned about their mental health and well-being. And uh, you know, that is the primary reason why we are pursuing this time change. So I would urge you to look at this time change outside of the vacuum and say, how is this time change going to affect the mental health and well-being of every community member? Is it possible to do something a lot less drastic? Absolutely. So 
So I'm in favor of option two or keeping it as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kimberly Sawyer. I reside on Lawton Circle and have a first grader attending Blue Point School. I also spoke at the last Board of Education meeting and I am very concerned about the Board's intention to move forward with the Option 3 schedule for our school system. Pushing the primary school start time forward one full hour in order to move the high school start time back by one hour and 15 minutes is too much. There needs to be a better solution. Option 2 would be my choice since the board does not feel that option two allows enough of a move forward to facilitate their plans for the high school students, then we need to wait for the bus study to come out this summer and come up with a new proposal at that time. I 100% believe that a schedule can be drafted to accommodate the sleep requirements of all of our students. I do not feel it is beneficial to the students or to the town of Scarborough to move forward until that has been accomplished. I know at the last meeting, several board members mentioned that when their children were in primary school, that they were early risers. I have spoken with numerous parents of current primary school students who also have children who are early risers. They fall on the lower end of the recommended sleep spectrum and are up at 6 or 6.30 a.m. They are perfectly healthy and functioning with less sleep. I have asked these parents if they feel their children's health or education is in any way negatively impacted by waking early but not starting school until 9 a.m. All have said absolutely not. I feel that this is the big difference. My child needs 12 to 13 hours of sleep to be happy, healthy, and able to do her best in school. I am fearful of the damage to her health and her education that an earlier start time will cause. Every single other parent I have spoken with, and there have been a lot, who has a child that requires the recommended 12 to 13 hours of sleep has the same fear. Yet, the early risers are not harmed by keeping the current school start time. As a parent, it is my obligation to make you, the Board of Education, and the Superintendent's Office aware that Option 3 will be harmful to my child as well as other primary school students. Is it not all of our jobs to collectively ensure that our children are healthy, cared for, and obtaining the best educational advantages possible? Just as you feel you cannot ignore the health concerns of our high school students, how can you move ahead with option three when countless parents have come forward to say this is a big health concern for our youngest students? If option three is the only option, then please let's not pass a new time change until we're able to develop one that supports the health needs of all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Julie Bassett and I live on Sandy Point Road. <coughs> I've emailed the board and spoken at a prior meeting, but I do have some additional thoughts following the April 6th meeting. The survey that went out in February was about one time change scenario. It did not ask about possible other times, nor did it ask for general community input on this issue. It's perfectly reasonable for people to garner from that that the board had already made its decision, despite your sentiments, that you had not. As the chair referenced, I went back to the leaders' online archives to reread the articles about start time change. I appreciate that coverage. However, I did not see anything at all talking about earlier K2 start times being needed until the January 27, 2017 article, which stated that they may, have to have start, they may have to start school earlier for elementary school in order to have middle school and high school start later in Scarborough. All earlier articles referenced later start times for middle school and high school only. If I've missed something, please let me know. There is a reason there's a higher percentage of K2 parents who seem to be more upset by this process than others. The past 18 months since the board has been looking into this, the information has all been on later start times for high school and middle students. All the science is focused there too. As a part of a group of parents who have only younger kids, it's not that we haven't been paying attention. We simply didn't realize the change would affect the youngest students as well. For you, this may be old news, but for us, it's all relatively recent and does feel rushed. It frustrates me that with option three, the board is seemingly choosing to prioritize older kids' sleep over younger kids' sleep, regardless of whether or not that was your intent. I recognize and accept that perhaps the board just happens to have and has always had kids who get up earlier in the day than do mine and who require less sleep. But the truth is, you don't know which of us is in the majority because that question has not been asked. Maybe Scarborough Elementary Age School children are on the higher end of the sleep numbers. 
When I do rough pulls with my friends and neighbors, it seems closer to two-thirds of whom are against an 8 a.m. start time for little, ki little kids, and that mainly has to do with adequate sleep. Scarborough schools are ranked pretty high, and our academic expectations are high as well, even starting in kindergarten. It's not all that hard to believe that four to eight-year-olds in Scarborough need closer to 11 to 13 hours of sleep. I know that mine certainly do, and most of their friends do too. Finally, we're in the midst of a particularly hard budget season. People are upset. I respectfully suggest making no change this year, or if a change absolutely must be made, choosing option two or some better, more fair and moderate compromise that is closer to option two than option three, which I believe is just too drastic on both ends. However, since you've stated your preference for option three, all I can do to ask of you now is for further compromise, to make a smaller change, as four of you expressed an informal preference slash willingness for at the April 6th meeting, to tweak the schedule further and push K2 10 to 15 to 20 minutes later, once you further examine deficiencies in transportation, as you put it, and you have the best audit results. Please, if you do go this route, um, please make that official. Please do something, anything, to acknowledge K2 parents' very real concerns and feedback so that we know we're being heard and valued and have ample time to come together before June. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone still in the hallway? I don't think so. Kelly, I'd like to make a statement. Um, hang on, Jackie. We need to end public comment, and then I need to I need to say something too. So, um, this is the time now. Yes. <laughs> sign in, please. You can you can sign in after you speak, uh, yeah. Larry. But yes, people. I, will. I was going to make that. Statement. Not to hold you up here. Uh, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive, here in Scarborough. Um, I think we had a good forum last night. I, I was very pleased with the, the attendance and the number of questions that came out. I thought, I thought it was a good discussion. However, I was a little disappointed this afternoon when I found out what the $1.5 million of reductions in the original budget meant. Um, the town's adjustment may include $215,000 of reduction in what they originally asked for. In this afternoon's document, it doesn't really detail what that is. Um, the town's income improvement comes from increasing the excise tax revenue by $200,000 from what was reported just three weeks ago. Another adjustment on the town side is the tried and true gimmick of moving expenses from the operating budget to items to the bond. That was something, this way, something that normally we get paid for this year will be bonded for three, five, or ten years in paid back. Not good budgeting. Basically the gimmicks that, sadly, we've come accustomed to, to see here in town. The school budget does not pretend to have any reductions. Your $872,000 of so-called savings comes from refinements in projected insurance and salary costs, again, from what was presented just three weeks ago, and moving other items from operating to bonding. As with the town budget, moving items that were deemed operating costs three weeks ago, has now, they have now become items to be bonded for and paid back over three or five or ten years. I did not want to come here tonight to make these these statements, um, but the facts are what they are. Um, I had expected more from my town and, and school board. What I did want to come here to, to say tonight was a suggestion for supporting the one town, one budget concept. Something that demonstrates the school board's awareness of the financial realities of 2017 and a concrete step in support of financial responsibility and the taxpayers of Scarborough. That proposal was simply this freeze the number of positions in the school district at its current level. I don't pretend to know what level of savings that would be, but I do know that it would be a tangible example to the community of your commitment to all residents of Scarborough. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Parody. I'm a junior at Scarborough High School. And I'm really sorry I don't have anything prepared. I just came from work, but I just wanted um, to talk about the idea of changing the start times and what I think about it and what the whole school or the majority of the people that I've talked to think about it. 
Um, I'm a student athlete, and I also obviously have a job. I work at Hannaford, um, and I know that the changing the time to 8:50 would really affect my senior year, and would affect everyone else that does play a sport and also holds a job. And I know that it would affect lots of people, even that just play a sport, especially three sport athletes. I thankfully only play one sport, but um, I can't imagine what it would be like to play three sports and to be getting out of school at such a later time and dealing with later practices and not having enough time at home to do homework. Um, personally, I know that a lot of high schoolers stay up late, and I know that I stay up late, and getting sleep is a bit, it's important, and I understand that you, you guys all understand that, um, but for me, <laughs> at this point, um, it's not something that I focus on, and I always, I'm staying up late regardless of when I get up just to try and get my work done, and I know that if the start time did change to something like 8.50, I would probably just stay up later, or I would, it would I don't really know what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that it wouldn't really affect um, affect my ability to uh, focus in class, and it wouldn't affect my um, attention level, because um, for me, I think anyone that attends high school as rigorous as Scarborough High School, it's all about um, if you want to be there, if you want to focus. And I just think that people that want to focus and um, people that really want to learn and pay attention are the ones that aren't falling asleep first period. Um, and then as far as an, being an athlete, it's a really stressful schedule and already. And so I feel like having such a late start time would really debilitate my ability to be able to obtain the grades I already have and um, it would just really I don't really know anything else to say I just am really hoping that you guys will consider not making such a drastic change because I know at the last meeting the vote went 6 to 1 so I'm just really hoping that you guys um, are able to reconsider and think about um, how big of a deal this is for the high scores especially and obviously I've heard from some of the parents too of younger kids and how hard that would be for younger kids to have to wake up so early. So I just hope that you will please consider either the second option or no change at all. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sarah Blaisdell and I live at 5 Farmhouse Road. And yes, my husband just spoke. In full disclosure, I'm a Scarborough High School teacher. I'm worried. I'm worried about our staff and our students' capability to adjust to all the changes that they face in the coming year. I'm not a teacher who runs out of the building at our contracted time, nor are most of my colleagues, and I don't want to be someone who does. I enjoy being able to spend time with my students after school and help them with their necessary struggles that they may have had from the lessons that day. I worry that a change to option three will make myself and colleagues become more likely to be t these types of teachers who aren't available to students because of their family life that they need to take care of. My personal fear is for when my, for when my children are in third, fourth, and fifth grade. Scarborough is lacking the child care for those age students, and I worry where will my, where will my kids go. And I worry about the future of my job in this district because I want to make sure that they are okay and provided for. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katherine Taylor and I'm a junior at Scarborough High School. I'm a very involved student, spending time participating in the school's Model UN Club, playing year-round field hockey, and volunteering at various places. In addition to that, these activities, I work part-time as a waitress at Piper Shores multiple weekdays. This brings me to my first issue with um, the proposed 9 o'clock start time. With such a change, the school day would end at 3.30, drastically cutting into the students' work schedules, which often started hour prior around 2.30. Additionally, this would cut into sports times. I, am, I know personally I have many away games <laughs> almost an hour away. This would mean that I would have to leave school early, missing class time, and having to make up work after school. Um, furthermore, this change would pose many implications for families with young children. I know for me, I have a younger brother, and this would mean that my parents would have to find child care support for him after school. Um, additionally, it's also impossible to guarantee that students will take advantage of this later start time, as they will be forced to stay up later finishing homework because of their after school time has been cut into. As a high school student who will be directly impacted by this change, 
I guarantee that there will be a, that this will put extreme stress on the town of Scarborough and cause many issues in the community. For these reasons, I strongly advocate for a less extreme start time or none at all. I hope you consider these points in addition to the massive impact it will have on everyone in the town. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, last call, anyone? No one else? Okay, so that closes public comment. And I just want to um, explain something outside of a discussion about any particular topic because it comes up a lot, including last night at the budget forum. Um, we are elected school board members across the state, and we're not different. We, we follow the state law for school board. We're elected by our community, but the moment we're sworn in, we're agents of the state. And we have to make all of our decisions based on what's in the best interest of the students for which we're elected. So public comment is a huge part of what we do, and we invite community engagement. We want to hear from people. <laughs> but you just need to know that it's different than the town council, and it's different than state legislators, that we are sworn the minute we take office as agents of the state to act in the best interest of the students. And I just want that to be clear across the community because it comes up a lot that um, if we're not um, listening, if we're not doing what you say, then we're not doing the job that you elected us for. We're elected to be working in the best interest of students as required by the state. And I just have been wanting to say that for months to just make, a, make it clear outside of any particular conversation because it is, it's a very peculiar and different thing about school boards, but that's the case across the state. It's state law. Um, so anyway, that's not really part of public comment or anything on the agenda, but I just wanted to make sure that was clear, um, that we have a different um, requirement for how we govern. Um, Jackie, was your comment about uh, with the calendar or budget? Because we should take that during that uh, well, agenda item. It's, it's basically about the board. And I want to thank these folks who have been in touch with us about the issue. And some of you have been uh, very, very passionate and not always nice is the term that comes up. I've always said that every time I vote, I am voting for what I think is in the best interest of our students. And I've always thought if it's in the best interest of our students, the parents and teachers will agree. But that doesn't seem to be the case because times have changed. This board is a great board. And for those of you who don't know, I have served off and on since 1977. I've served with a lot of different people. This is a dedicated group of people who have the best interest of our students always in the forefront. I will tell you something else that came up in the emails to me. This board has never had discussions over the phone or in emails. All of our deliberations happen here. Now, I will tell you that I have always been in touch with either the superintendent or the chair of the board or the chair of a committee if I disagree with something that's going to be on the, that is on the agenda or I question something that is coming up so that they can be prepared to answer my questions, and I encourage others to do it as well, and other people do. We truly listen to you. We try and, and come together as a community for the benefit of our children. We try to come together as a community for the benefit of the community. Our discourse is civil. We want it to continue to be civil. <coughs> We want to debate and discuss always. And you can count on it. And just because I vote one way and they vote another, or vice versa, three to four, whatever it happens to be, doesn't mean we're enemies. It means we're coming at it differently. We all have the best interest of our students and the education of our children in the forefront. Please continue to be involved. Please continue to be part of the discussion. Please allow us to disagree on behalf of you 
and your children because that's what we're here for. We need to work together and this will continue to be a great town and have great schools as long as we do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so that takes us right up to 6.0 new business. 6.1 meeting minutes of March 16th, 2016. Do I have a motion? Move approval as printed. Second. Any questions, comments, or changes? All in favor? Seven, thank you. 6.2, uh, second reading of the proposed FY 2018 budget. We have a motion. We have a bunch of motions. So I have Take a away. little bit of um, something to say, then I'm going to turn it over to Kate to sort of fill you all in, and then we'll go through my motions. A point of order, I think most of the people are here about, about the calendar issue. Do you think it would not be in our best interest to swap that and get that off the table? I disagree. I mean, I, I don't okay. disagree that the people that commented wanted to talk about start times, but the budget affects every single person in this room, so I think that's a topic okay. that I wouldn't skip it. So, have at it. So, those of us, um, thank you, by the way, um, those of us that have been involved in this year's budget um, development are grateful for the work that we've, we've done with the joint um, Town Council Finance Committee. We work um, with them very closely over the last five, six months, um, meeting twice a month, sometimes a little more than that. Recently it's been a little bit more than that. Um, but we're building on our commitment over the last two years to really look at one town, one budget. And so We've continued our efforts to make budget information available to the public through the detailed budget book, which I'm sure you've all read and know by heart, um, a shared town council budget portal, multiple public meetings, the budget forum that happened last night, um, social media, print media, et cetera. All of us um, share the goal of ensuring that citizens who wish to be engaged in this process will find the resources to learn more about our schools and the town and um, how we are making use of our resources. So I'm going to have Kate sort of walk through, things have changed since the first reading of the budget. Um, I'm going to have her walk through those changes and then I have some motions for the board to handle. Thank you, Jody. Uh, good evening, folks. My name is Kate Bolton. I'm the business manager for the school department. For those of you who haven't come specifically for the budget tonight, um, we do have some packets of handouts that the board's going to be looking at. If people are interested in taking those away or having a look at them later on, they're right up here on this first chair, and I'll probably move them over to this chair uh, so they're more accessible. Um, as Jody said, the, the finance committees for the, the town and the school have been working since the first reading, which was on April 6th for the school board, April 5th for the town council, um, to refine and, and amend the budget proposal that was put before those two bodies at the beginning of April. We've had uh, some changes that have happened um, by uh, no choice of our own, but by outside forces that have changed. And we've had some changes that have been made by our going back through the budget and going over different areas of it and trying to refine our projections from our original proposal. Um, so I've given the board a, a packet that's, you know, you know me, I'm, I'm full of lots of papers. Um, there is a uh, top page that is basically the, the motions, the budget motions that Jody is going to ask you to respond to this evening. If you take that first stapled set of pages off and you look at the marvelous candy colored uh, sheet for which I am famous, this is the only one I'm going to walk you through and I'm going to do it quite quickly because I know you have a lot on your plate this evening. Um, but essentially this sheet is a, a working document that takes you through the story of first reading to where we are today. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a couple of things quickly there, um, not to read it to you because you have it before you and you have it available. I also will say to the folks, I didn't really expect to have everybody here need a copy of this, so I didn't probably bring enough 
uh, but I will post this on the website so everybody can see all the different elements. What I've given the board is the one document that I'll talk about, which is the process of how we got from first reading to where we are tonight. And then the backup materials are all basically revised versions of documents that you've already seen. Um, so any changes that have been made can be reflected on those various summary sheets. Um, those, again, will be posted and available and will be part of the budget documents that are available uh, to the public. So uh, just to give you a sense of the, the two pieces that we've worked with, um, after the first reading, we received several pieces of good news, the best being from Anthem, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. We received our um, insurance premium rates for the year that starts on July 1st for us. And uh, we were pleasantly surprised in that we had budgeted a 5.5% increase uh, in our first reading, and they came in at a 1.21% increase, which was a great gift. Um, we also had a lower than expected uh, increase, actually a small decrease in our dental premiums. And we had a small decrease in the projections for property casualty and liability insurance. All of those things happened uh, before our meeting with the Joint Finance Committee on uh, April 13th. And so we presented them with an interim reduction in the school budget of $251,000. And that's represented in that first blue block on that page that you're looking at. The second section of the page uh, in the yellow takes you through some additional reductions that were made in collaboration with the two finance committees and uh, working with Julie, myself, and all of our school leaders to try and find some refinements that would allow us to shrink uh, the, the budget that was proposed at first reading. Um, those are, uh, they're, they're found in a couple of different areas and, and some of them are clumped together, but I'll, I'll just sort of list them quickly because I think they're helpful to, to pay attention to. One is um, to reduce the uh, technology budget, technology equipment budget by $100,000. I believe you know that we've been trying to move from CIP to operating budget each year, a little por portion of the tech refresh funding that we do each year. And uh, we've got to the point where we had about $300,000 in operating. Typically about 500000 of that was all in CIP. This year we were making another incremental, incremental change to increase that by another $100,000. And in the circumstances, we decided it wasn't the year to do that, so we've taken that out. We've also deferred one of our new investment proposals. So you'll see there's a refined sheet there um, at the cost of $23,000. We've also refined and reduced our salary and benefit projections. And there's two reasons that we've done that. Apart from Anthem, uh, we are getting continual changes and in information from folks about whether they're retiring, whether they're going to be leaving the district, whether they're going to be staying with the district, and uh, what kind of benefit changes they've had since the time that we started these projections in December. Um, those are the typical types of reductions and changes that we've been able to make. Um, again, it goes to the fact that when we start our projections early in the year, we often don't have terribly accurate information to go on. So we continue to take a look at that. Um, the last item that I would mention there, no, I take it back, there's one more. The staff development lines, we had hoped to increase those a little bit this year. We've dialed those back to the current level, and in some cases we've cut them back. We don't like to cut staff development, but we do realize that that's a discretionary expense, and it's one area where we could pare things back a little bit. Um, and finally, re utility projections have been refined. We have a new electricity contract this year. And that's going to kick in in December, so we're pretty excited about that. We might be able to see some savings there. Um, when we get down to the bottom of the yellow section, you're looking at non-tax revenues, and you're looking at an increase, a projected increase of $130,000 in non-tax revenues. I think that many of you were in the room when we were talking about the MLTI program and the fact that the state is planning to create a slightly different model from what they've had in past years and to send funding directly to districts so that they can manage their own providing laptops to 7th and 8th graders. Um, that's something where we were really unclear on the model. Um, we're still a little bit unclear on the model, 
but we've been promised, when the state makes promises, we wonder, we've been promised that they're going to be sending us this $130,000 to support the purchase of laptops for our 7th and 8th graders in the coming year. So we've basically booked that revenue and added it to the bottom line. So what Jody's going to ask you to do this evening is to make a series of motions that are going to change the original budget that you voted on. You approved it in first reading. You'll have an amendment, and then you'll have, uh, you'll have created a second reading budget for us to move forward with. And I'm just realizing now that a lot of these people were not at the budget forum last night. And so I want to just take a little bit of time, not much, I promise because I know no, we're all that's important. But ahead. I think Three there's minutes. some key points that I don't <laughs> think um, many in the audience know about. So um, Kate mentioned the circumstance that we're in. That circumstance is that we're losing $1.4 million from the state. It's a 40% reduction to what we had last year. So what that means is we are now minimal receivers. We receive 2.1 million dollars from the state, but we're receiving that two, I know numbers get so boring and people are like, Ugh. but we received 2.1 million dollars because that is one third of our special education costs from 2016. That's how that number is, is determined. Um, their original GPA, general purpose aid funding for us was 1.4 million. Um, and so the 2.1, I just, I'm looking at my slides from last night and trying to um, get you all the information you could possibly ever want. Um, so the 1.4 was the original amount from the GPA calculations, but because we're a mi minimum receiver now, we'll get the 33% of our special education costs from 2016, which brings us to the $2.1 million. Um, in 2009, I think, it, we received $7 million from the state. So if you fast forward to 2018, we're projected to, to receive $2.1 million. That's a 69.6% reduction in state funding. That ultimately requires the taxpayers of our town to pick up. So that's the circumstances that we're under. That's what we're talking about when we're going back um, from a really good budget that was um, brought forward from the superintendent and the town manager. Um, we're now asking them as a finance committee to go back and find $1.5 million in savings and we had a joint um, meeting today and we asked them to go back again and find an additional two hundred dollars to $275,000. These cut, not cuts, I'm not going to say cuts, but these refinements in an already good budget will have a direct impact on your students, on our students. So I get that the calendar issue is a big issue and it's emotional and it doesn't feel so good. Um, we hear that, we understand that, but they're two separate issues and so I, I ask you and, um, to take a breath and, and remember that they're two separate issues and so we can disagree on calendar and start times but we need to come together for a budget that serves our students. It's that simple. Um, so that's sort of my soapbox before the fun numbers come out. Okay, so we're ready for the You motion. ready? All right, so I move approval to amend the FY18 school operating budget expenditures approved at the school board's first reading on April 6, 2017 as follows. Reduce the general fund operating expenditures by $565,772 to an amended general fund expenditure budget that will total $47,563,168. I also uh, reduce adult education budget expenditures by $763. The amended adult education expenditure budget will total $182,701. Reduce school nutrition budget expenditures by $11,058. The amended school nutrition expenditures budget will total $1,521,000 and uh, $1,521,802. Second. Okay. So discussion? 
I guess I could have done my. Well, I, I have a comment right off the bat just to, um, it concerns me the um, reduction of the new investment proposal for the part-time athletic trainer. Um, we have an enormous number of students in the district that participate in athletics. Um, and we already have a very overworked trainer and many kids that visit the trainer's office daily for a long period of time. And they're also responsible for the concussion protocols and bringing kids back in. And there's testing that goes on every day for that. It's a big deal. And this has been a deferred item for a lot of years. And so that one, that concerns me. Um, I know it has to come from someplace, but I just want to put that out there that that's one that I I don't want to see any of them, but that one in particular just seems like has a huge and immediate impact. I wonder if uh, if I can be helpful in in describing why we came to that so that solution as part of our our reduction proposal. And I'm, I think Mike is probably in the room. He'll probably throw something at me if I if I say something wrong. But uh, what we have had uh, in this current year is a contracted services arrangement with an outside provider to support our current athletic uh, um, trainer who's on staff with some part-time hours. And what we were hoping to do was to um, increase that investment, take it from contracted services, and actually hire a person who worked for Scarborough. Uh, as an assistant athletic trainer because, as, as uh, Kelly points out, it, there's a significant need there. Um, what Mike has volunteered and uh, is hoping to accomplish is to, with the same money that he currently has for contracted services, perhaps try to negotiate a different agreement with a different provider that will allow us to expand those hours um, at a similar cost to what we're paying now. It's not ideal. We would definitely prefer to have someone on, on staff um, there's a, an enormous advantage to that, um, but in the circumstances, uh, Mike was willing to be really creative with his budget and, and try to um, accomplish the same goal or at least a, a good par part of it um, in a less expensive way. Okay. I guess if it's less expensive and we have the, the support for the students, I guess that's all right. Jackie, did you want to? Yes, I'm just wondering about the reduction in, in the food services uh, budget. Do you anticipate that we'll have to vote on that reduction when we get to the spring, when we're moving monies around? Um, in other words, pay it off? The, uh, the, the model that's currently in place as of the first reading and hasn't been changed to this point um, is that We've, uh, the reduction in the expenditures for um, school nutrition is simply the, the, a reflection of the reduction in Anthem costs that we've projected. So what we're doing is we're shrinking our expected costs just a little bit. But there is still in the current budget proposal that you're voting on tonight um, an application of $200,000 upfront budgeted of uh, tax funding to make sure that at the end of the year we don't have to do uh, a fund balance transfer to cover any deficit. Um, so that still remains in the uh, revenue side of the, of the um, school nutrition budget. Whether that continues to be there, it, it, there's still some, some, uh, some road to travel, but in the budget that you're voting on this evening in second reading, there is um, budgeted upfront funding in tax dollars for school nutrition. And, and that's, in my opinion, that's the reason for it is not clear. We've talked about deficits in food services over the years and how we're going to fully fund it in this budget. And then I see a reduction without an explanation it's, that it's due to a reduction in the amount of money we're going to have to pay for employee insurance. So. You know, it's just little things like that. If, if I have to ask the question, the public will be asking the questions as well. I just want to point that out. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is just for your reference, Jackie, on this blue section up here, it does say it's reduction in insurance. So 
Yeah, and, and I, as I said, staff. I don't I don't want to go through every single piece of paper I've handed you because you'll yeah. hit me in over the head and throw me out. But uh, there is there's also one in there that that shows the um, expenditures and revenues for each section, and you'll see the school nutrition one is in there with some tax requests uh, attached to it. And these documents will go up on the budget portal on yeah. the website. Once, once the uh, actions are taken this evening, however that turns out, we'll, uh, we'll post them up so that people can read through all the various summaries and, and see what the changes are. Anybody else have any comments or questions about the budget? I just want to thank Julie for the work that she's done. I think that her budget was fantastic to start with, and thank you for the work that you've done to refine and, and bring it down as much as you have. Right. To the finance committee okay, and thank you, all the thanks Kate. to the finance committee and to Kate thank and you. our leadership team. It's a collaborative process. Absolutely. And Donna? Yeah, and I just want to comment on uh, the finance committee joint work that was done with the town council. You know, people don't realize the amount of hours that go into doing this work on the school side. It starts way back in November and December in discussions and then moves along into the town council work with both finance committees and I think last night un unfortunately poorly attended in my opinion with 18,000 people that live here and under 50 people attending that meeting is not a good turnout. Makes me wonder about the use of our time. Um, but you have used numerous sources in which to explain to the public if they wish to know there's everything. <laughs> There's so many routes. If there's anything left that we haven't done for communications, I certainly don't know what it is because we use numerous ways in which we are telling the public about, about this. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that we're, we're now moved to you know, minimum receivership and it means that the town is, is going to have to decide where and how it wants to step up in order to meet the needs of its, of its school system from now and probably moving forward for a number of years. So, um, but I mean, kudos to all, all of our, our finance people on both sides working on this incredible document. I do just have one question about minimal, minimal receivership. I know that we expect to be there for at least the foreseeable future, but how can we ever climb back up without Wishing a terrible economic fate on our town. <laughs> like what? Well, that's one option. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the other option is to have a drastic enrollment change. Um, I think one of the things that, that's the hardest to explain about how subsidy is allocated is that it's less a static position of a, of, of a town in any given year as it is the change from one year to the next as compared to the change from one year to the next in all the surrounding towns and all the towns in the state of Maine. So. It's quite possible that with a small increase in population of students and with uh, you know, either a leveling off or an uh, averaging out of valuation in other communities that we would climb back up again. Uh, it's just that Scarborough has had such a strong economic performance in mm -hmm. comparison with other communities in the state in recent years um, that com combined with a small decline in our population which is projected to go back up again. Um, it it makes us feel as though it's unlikely that that position is going to change um, in, in, any, in, in any year soon. What would definitely change the picture for us and what we can certainly hope for and certainly ask our legislators for is more funding for education in general. Um, the more funding goes into K-12 education in the state of Maine, the more likely it is that all communities will benefit and all community subsidy will go up. And you may not know the answer to this, but do we know of other districts in the state that are also minimal receivers? Um, there are a number every year, and um, I don't think the names would be un unfamiliar to you, um, particularly you know Cumberland County, I believe um, York is currently one, um, but it does change from year to year, yeah. again, with that sort of up and down. It's sort of a misery loves company impact. sort of situation. Yeah. But. Yeah, the state doesn't publish a list of minimum. Yeah, I didn't know if there was like a banner, <laughs> ticker that goes like across. Like they, they send you a badge or something. Yeah, congratulations. One of the other things I would add just before um, there's a vote on this motion is um, 
to one of our community members' points earlier, the budget is a continual process. So it's intensified from December through June, but we are always looking at our budget, looking at our expenditures, looking at our projections, refining, adjusting, um, assessing, and trying to be as fiscally responsible as we can. So um, even, even this budget that you're reading tonight, there's going to be more changes that occur over the next few weeks. So I think it's really, um, really quite confusing when you think about the way the process works and when the first readings have to happen um, and then when, um, when, the, when the budget actually gets passed over to the town council. And then, so even after tonight, really what we're doing as a school board is, or what you're doing as a school board is, is really passing this school budget onto the town council where they can make further recommendations for other areas that, or not other areas, but um, for um, other reductions that may need to happen in order for us to meet our goals as a town. And that, again, goes back to the one town, one budget um, motto that we all are committed to. So I think that's an important thing for folks to understand. And of course, when we're looking at a school budget that relies on human services and human resources, of course, there's lots of volatility with both um, who's delivering the service and who's receiving the service. So dependent upon turnover in staff and their salary or their benefit needs, um, there might be changes in, in our budget and also depending upon our students and the services that they require, there could be changes in our budget. So um, it's, a, it's, a const it's constantly in motion and um, I don't know how to really help folks fully appreciate the complexity of that um, except to say that um, it, it's a never ending process. Anyone else? Anything? I have a, just have a question about uh, w when we will vote on uh, the suggestion of what to do if we get more state subsidy. Are we going to do that this evening or at a later time? So, you want to go? You can talk to her. So the joint um, finance committees have uh, um, decided and agreed upon that if if we receive what happens is we pass our budget June 13th, town hall is voting 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, we pass our budget and then the state usually ends up passing their budget after that. And in years past, we've, there's potential that we receive more funding from the state. But in years past, it always just goes to fund balance for future years. You can't use it in the current year. So what the joint finance committees have agreed to um, is that we will, the town council will approve language that says if we get more money above what we've already been allocated, 50% of that will be used this year to help reduce the tax rate, and then 50% of it will go to future years for fund balance. And that's the result of new legislation? Yes. So long as we know what that amount is prior to the setting of the tax rate. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we're we ready to vote on this motion. All in favor of motion one, amending the FY18 school operating budget as stated. Seven, thank you. Motion two. All right, so motion. I move approval to amend the FY18 school operating budget revenues approved at the school board's first reading on April 6, 2017 as follows. Increased general fund operating non-tax revenues by 130,000 and amended general fund non-tax revenues will now total 6,335,475. Second. Any discussion about this one? Kind of covered it with the MLTI. And okay, all in favor? Seven, thank you. Okay, move approval to amend the FY18 school CIP budget approved at the school board's first reading on April 6, 2017, as follows. Increased technology CIP expenditures by 100,000 for middle school tech refresh. Amended CIP expenditures bu budget will total technology 331,200, facilities and maintenance 769,000, transportation 318,000, for a total of 1,418,200. Second. Any discussion about this? This motion? 
I just want to just to mention that normally uh, with new technology and the facilities and maintenance budget, even though the numbers look large, it usually leads to overall savings. And for example, the investment that we have made in LED lighting has reduced our overall expenses over the last four or five years by more than $70,000. So I think it's important for people to understand that the number may look large here, but it reaps benefits for the town as a whole over the long haul. I also just want to point out um, the middle school is due for their tech refresh, and it, it's fortuitous because um, MLTI is the main learning technology initiative that's been in existence for many years and is now going away as we know it. Um, the state provided individual laptops for 7th and 8th grade students and staff for the middle school to support that program, and that's not happening anymore. Um, it's kind of been chipped away for a while and a little disorganized, and so now their plan and their promise that Kate was talking about is reimbursement per computer rather than supplying the device. So it required a, it's going to require, which we had already done proactively, a shift to our network because they are not providing dollars, we think, for that upgrade. Um, so a lot of things are coming into this um, kind of all at once, but it was the middle school's cycle of refresh anyway, but just the way those computers will come to us now. It's yeah, I think, I think the easiest way to think of it is that the state's basically getting out of the business of providing computer devices and, and support and networking, and they're giving the districts funding instead uh, to take care of that on their own. And it's, you know, you could argue that that might be a more efficient model. It certainly is for Scarborough because we've got a great IT team. They're already um, hitting the ground running, and they, they have um, managed, uh, Jen Lim has managed to budget in such a way that our cost for supplying MLTI devices to the entire middle school will not cost us any more than what it would have to be in the state program. So uh, we're fortunate, as you said, Kelly. Anyone else for this one? Okay. All in favor of motion three? Seven? Thank you. So I just have one more statement, but there's no action required. Okay. Um, there's another adjustment to the tax request has been recommended, which does not require um, any action from the school board, which is funding of, of capital budget items by the town finance office. In the original FY18 budget proposal, $559,897 of town and school capital budget was designated to be financial, uh, financed through appropriations, tax revenue. Um, as part of the town manager and superintendent's recommended amendments, um, $134,985 of town capital budget funding would be shifted from appropriations to bonded funds. $164,000 of school capital budget funding would be shifted from appropriation to bonded funds. So total impact of budget amendments proposed for the school board are, um, this gives you a general overview of everything we just did. 577,593 operating budget expenditure reduction, $130,000 operating budget revenue increase, combined with the $164,000 capital funding appropriation reduction, for a total reduction in education budget tax request of 871,593 from $43,639,789 to $42,932,196. Thank you. Thank you Jody, for that. I feel quite evil for giving you a list of so many numbers. <laughs> so beautifully. <laughs> really fine. Okay. So now we are at 6.3, school board's adoption of a 2017-18 school calendar. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the 2017-18 school calendar presented as option three and reviewed at the first reading on April 6, 2017, except that 
the administration is directed to implement the school hours as presented in option three for the 2018-19 school year. The 2017-18 school year school hours will remain unchanged from the current 2016-17 school hours. Second. Do you want to yeah. defend it? I do. Go for it. Um, so collectively we have taken many, many hours over the last um, few years to analyze and adjust the school start times in Scarborough. And throughout the past years, we've continued to brainstorm solutions and look to our leadership and, and the superintendent, both past and current, um, for solutions. And the most, recent, most recently, we've continued to collect information by reading scholarly literature and um, most recent studies and engaging community members, uh, staff, parents, and students through surveys. In addition, we've held one-on-one -on -one meetings and um, small group discussions to gather input from stakeholders. We have engaged in all of this work for one reason and one reason only. Uh, we want to make the best decision for all of our students K through 12. Over the last few weeks, it has become clear that this is a very complex and emotional issue. Um, and there is no simple answer that and we want to thank all of the parents and the staff um, and the students who have come out and, and voiced their opinion um, and contributed to our decision-making process by communicating with us um, by email or here at meetings or phone calls. We also um, thank the school leadership for their flexibility and their um, continued commitment to our students. So I believe, and this is just me, telling you my opinion, I believe these start times are correct and in, is the correct framework for Scarborough Public Schools. Um, I believe that the high school and the middle school students should start later and I feel that 8 a.m. is not a drastic, um, unrealistic time for younger students. Now, having said that, I also believe deeply that there are um, a lot of things happening in education in general and here in Scarborough. And if I can give the gift of time to our superintendent to work through, um, like Mr. Nielsen said, I have to call Mr. Nielsen because he was an administrator at my high school when I was there. Um, there's the consideration of the Vogue students. There's NEASC happening at the high school next year. There's proficiency-based um, education. There are a number of things, big, important things that need to go right. And so if I can give the gift of time to the superintendent, I'm willing to do that. But the times are changing. I believe firmly in these times. And now if, um, did it say in my, yes, so that we direct the administration for the, the times for next year. If this gives her the time to research further the bus situation or athletics and, and figure out how that can work, then we need to give her that time to make those decisions and, and find the right balance. So for me, the times are correct. It's just the implementation of the project. It's like, it's like business. If, if there's a major um, new initiative that happens, you don't ask the CEO to just come out the next month and have it done. So I'm willing to give her the time to do the implementation and give the leadership the time they need um, to work with staff and to, to work through um, issues that I think are solv solvable um, and strategic. I, I want this to work correctly and I want it to be done right. So I'm willing to um, expand the implementation so that it's 14 months instead of four months, or uh, anyone else? Jackie? I like the idea of deferring. I'm not happy with the idea that we're going to vote to keep the same hours. I think that, and I'm trying to formulate in my mind how to amend this so that it gives the superintendent 
not only the flexibility of trying to implement, but to but to make recommendations to the board on perhaps different hours. Uh, I have confidence in the superintendent and in our in our administrative group leadership team uh, to work it out for us. That. I know how passionate you are about these hours, but I'm just as passionate about the fact that I think it's too dramatic a change. And um, so I would like the, the superintendent to have some flexibility, not only in how to implement, but whether the hours are in fact what we should be aiming for. So, keep talking. I'll think about how to word it. <laughs> we'll come back. Anyone else want to chime in? Nobody else. Somebody, talk? somebody talk. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, first, first, you know, we've spent an incredible amount of hours on this work. You know, going back, I don't know, what two years ago now that we had our first meeting in Saco, so it's been under discussion for quite some time. Numerous meetings have been held this year, last year. You know, maybe people weren't aware of it and didn't go to the meetings. You know, I don't know. We, it, we can only do so much to notify people that these things are happening. Um, for me, it is about the health and the science and not so much about the convenience. And I liken it to a school calendar as well, just in terms of what days are we going to be in school? What days will school start? Will be before Labor Day, after Labor Day? And all those issues become inconvenient for people. But in the end, the board has to decide the right thing for all our kids that we believe in. And, and in this situation, I believe this is the right thing to do. Um, I think by holding it off a year, it gives the possibility for two things to happen. The transportation audit, which has been on my mind for the past several weeks um, around the issues of having a good audit done by an independent group is going to give us a lot of information that might bring new light to tightening up those pickup times for the kids. I'm not as concerned of an 8 a.m. start time for our, for our younger kids. I'm more concerned that trying to get them at the pickup time of 7.15 the earliest that feels comfortable to me. I know in my own family, with my own grandson, with the potential to go to school here in a few years, my daughter has to be at work. Her husband has to be at work at 8 o'clock. She will be inconvenienced in the event that she has to wait until 8.15. So there are people in the town who haven't spoken up. And, you know, when people don't speak up about an issue that is so significant, I think they're okay with it. I think that probably means they, they don't have any big drive one way or the other. That, that's how, I just am sorry, that's how, how I've always felt about these decisions. The other thing that can happen is that we have a new community services director. This is going to give that person time to get on board with what else can be offered for our kids in terms of child care mm -hmm. after school. It is just another hour, maybe it's a little bit more than an hour that would make a difference for our younger kids. But, you know, hopefully there will be some programs and he'll bring some new ideas and new enlightenment and that this time will allow for that to happen. So, um, and again, like I said the last time, the big um, heavy determinant for me was that when we went to that meeting, and I know I mentioned this before, but when we went to that meeting, there were numerous doctors there, and he was from the Sleep Institute. And for me, he was giving us um, data that may be um, less emotional because he wasn't talking about his own kids or looking for his own data and all that. He was really taking a look at the data that he has about sleep. And so I put a lot into what he said. An hour or more is what's going to bring the change. So changing for a half an hour, to me, was you might as well do nothing. You might as well not change it, to me, because 
the impact wasn't going to be there till there was a minimum of 60 minutes more. So that's where I'm at with this and I'll support it. Gary? Um, yeah, uh, my mind hasn't changed at all that this is the right thing to do for our community. I think that elementary kids should be going to school earlier than high school kids, uh, middle school and high school kids. Um, so the only thing that's changed for me is the timeline. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that this year, over this year, we're going to continue to have conversations um, as a board, with leadership, with the community about how this can work best for our community. Um, uh, I, a couple of thoughts um, about the high school teachers, about what that new um, schedule would mean. I would just want to point out that it would be the exact same schedule that our fantastic K2 staff is on right now, and they, they also engage in professional development and various other sorts of family life needs. Um, so the high school teachers having the same schedule that the K2 teachers have been having all of this time doesn't seem completely unfair to me. Um, and the science says really between 8.30 and closer to 9 is, is a good target. And I, I understand and I sympathize with how that will affect um, everything that happens after school in a day. And maybe this year is also an opportunity to talk about that in Scarborough, um, to think about uh, if we're really doing everything to the uh, optimal result for our students. Um, so I just think it's time this evening to shift the conversation from if this is happening to how it's going to happen. And um, that's the goal for me in, in um, lengthening this implementation process. Jackie? I was originally going to offer an amendment this evening uh, for an 8.30 start time as opposed to a 9. But if, if we, sounds like there is there is uh, support for deferring this for a year. So I would amend the motion to state that the superintendent have the flexibility to look at all aspects of the issue and not be constrained by time frames. Does anyone want to second that amendment so we can talk about second. it? Okay. Somebody want to talk about that? Well, to be clear, uh, I guess my um, concern with that amendment, which I, I know where you're going with that, and I agree with, with, I think, your thought process on it, but for me, I feel like that opens it back up as to, is this something we should do? And I'm not, that's, I'm not there. I agree that if the the framework of later high school and earlier primary intermediate is, is the root you're thinking, then I'm fine with that. But I don't want the, f I don't want to give the impression that it's now still back up for discussion whether this happens or not. But I want to give the superintendent the authority to tweak it 15 minutes this way, 15 minutes that way, to, if, if information comes back that that's a possibility, I want to give her that opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, and that's my intent. Okay. My intent is, first of all, I've said right from the start that there needs to be a change. I agree with that premise. What I have said for the last several weeks is that I think what we're trying to do to go to 9 o'clock is too dramatic, too drastic. So, and that's what I can't support. But change is going to have to happen if, in the, from my perspective, in the best interest of our students. But I would prefer to leave it how that's going to happen to come back to the board from the superintendent. And, and from what I understand, that is the policy. The, the superintendent yeah. um, determines times. We determine the, the calendar, start date, end date, matching days off with um, VOC 
But your original amendment said that we're going to take take option three and just defer it. No, I don't no. want it, option three to be cast in stone. The times of option three. But I agree with you that the times don't need to be cast in stone because ultimately she has the authority on that. And that's all I'm asking. Yeah. As long as we un everybody understands that. Mm -hmm. I, th I think so. maybe when the bus audit comes back that that might give us that five or seven mm -hmm. or ten minute window that we're all kind of looking for, or at least that's the way I'm looking at it. So Right, and, and my amendment... Um, now I'm going to go back. The administration is directed to implement the school hours. I, I could have been clearer with that she has the, that authority. So, can I ask a yes. So, Jackie, are you, I'm trying to understand, so are you saying like you're more in favor of option two, but option two would be tweaked? Because I'm, I'm like, are you interested in having the, K to two or K to five go later, or, or are you just saying it is really up to the superintendent? I guess you know, we're, like, where do you, where are you falling more on one side or the other? I guess I fall in, into the category where I think that the middle school and the high school should be at an 8:30 start as opposed to a nine o'clock start, and that if we have to adjust the elementary start times to match that, it will take them out of that very early start. You don't think can I, I can don't I, know. I can I talk to you about that, just that scenario? Um, 8.30 was the goal. That's what we had all seen, all the research. 8.30 was our hope. 8.30 was the goal. 8.30 means that primary kids are going to school starting at 7.30 or at 9.30. And neither of those are good options. You need an hour for the bus. There has to be a full as we need a full, now. Yes. Right. Yes. As told by our transportation director, to do the full runs around the town, it needs to be an hour. So that means primaries at 7.30 or 9.30. And in all our discussions about professional development late starts, we've heard from many, 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 many parents that starting later in the day is a huge inconvenience and um, isn't ideal for family life. So that was why the times for option three were more, um, hit more of our goals, which were to not have anyone at a bus stop before seven, to not have a bus ride longer than 50 minutes, to not have professional development meetings go past 5.15 or 5.30. I mean, so that's with our bus constraints of one hour. That's why 8.30 couldn't work. We all were hoping 8.30 was going to be it, but it it makes it go too far in one way or the other. Well, that's why I would like to amend the motion so that the superintendent and her team mm -hmm. have the opportunity, uh, if, if possible. I cannot vote for a 9 o'clock start time for the high school. I just, it's just not in my realm of possibilities, quite frankly. I like the idea we're going to defer, and I like the idea that we will give the superintendent and her team uh, the opportunity to make recommendations to the committee. I just want to point out, just for clarity, that it's 8.50, not 9, for the high school. And I th if we're talking minutes, we're talking minutes. So mm -hmm. it's a 20-minute shift? No, not even, because it's 7.35 right now. Hour 15. Hour and 15 total. So. Um, Anyone else want to share thoughts? I guess. Oh. Go. I, okay. Wait, somebody. Oh, Mary. Do you oh want no, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit more to option two because we have heard so much support for that, and I, maybe people in the room are wondering why we're not um, talking about option two. And the big reason is that the science that we've been working on, our whole basis for having this conversation is to get closest to the recommended start time by numerous health organizations, and that is between 8.30 and 9 a.m. Um, we don't want change for change's sake. We don't want everybody's schedules to change for no, for, for a reason, for a target that doesn't even, 
it doesn't fulfill the reason why we're talking about this. And the other thing I don't like about option two is that it displaces the elementary schools, um, Wentworth by half an hour and the primary, the K2 schools by 10 minutes. And that's also going in the wrong direction, in my, in my opinion. And um, I think option two only ever would have been seen as kind of a stopgap to get to where we finally wanted to get to, which was uh, closer to the 8.30, 8.45, 8.50 um, high school time. Um, and we don't see any point in making everybody shift their schedules twice. So that's why we're talking about option one, keeping the time the same for a year, and then making the switch to the more preferred time that we, is our target. Um, I'll stop there. So just to be sure I understand this now, um, in, in t thinking about Jackie's question and about what you're saying, there is the flexibility, given the First Amendment that was mentioned, that the superintendent can come in with what the results of the transportation audit are and so a recommendation. Pr procedurally through policy, what will happen is that next year around February, um, we'll, January really, we'll engage with conversations with our regional partners um, to set a common calendar like we do every year. Uh, and then I will present to the policy subcommittee a recommendation or multiple recommendations for what the 1819 school calendar will be. And then the policy subcommittee will bring those recommendations to the school board for adoption. Similar to the process here, but the timeline will be um, the timeline will be pushed earlier into Early. the in the calendar year because we'll make that decision by March 1st per our policy. Mm -hmm. So really. Um, with the decision that is on the table right now for a vote, um, as, as your superintendent, I'm feeling grateful for the additional time to be really strategic and to be really thoughtful around what are some of the um, essential communications that need to happen between now and, the, and making a change, but also allowing us to develop a really thoughtful plan, implementation plan. I know um, several of our school and district leaders always are already have ideas around what are some of the things that we can begin thinking about, um, what are the metrics that we need to have in place so that when a change is made, we're able to assess the impact of that change, um, both the, the positive impact and any potential negative impacts, and that will allow us to be you know, the evidence-based decision makers that, that you all want and need us to be, because to, to Carrie's point, change does not always equal improvement um, and improvement and, and in order for us to really see improvement whether we're looking at student outcomes or um, sleep patterns um, all of the various student outcomes that we've talked about we need to be really strategic about that and we need to be really thoughtful about that and this is a this is a huge shift not just um, not just behaviorally for folks, but philosophically, um, emotionally, and we want to really ensure that our families, our staff families, our students, our, and their families are able to um, think about all of all of the changes that they need to make in their own personal lives in order for us to make this structural change within the school day. Uh, again, um, the added time allows us to have a really thorough transportation audit and to look at any possible efficiencies that we can find. So I, too, appreciate the flexibility to be able um, to stick with the um, intent of this decision, which is that elementary would start before middle school and high school, but that we can, you know, plus or minus a few minutes here and there, make adjustments that best meet the needs of all students. So we need to vote on the amendment, unless you're rescinding the amendment because you think Jody's motion covers it. If, if Jody's motions cover, motion covers it, I will withdraw as long as the superintendent has the flexibility to be the superintendent in this issue. <laughs> okay. okay, so back to the original motion. Does anybody else have things they want to say about that? One, okay. one last thing. I, I just want to say that um, while I see the wisdom in, in prolonging this implementation, I just also want to say that it really does pain me to um, for these adolescent kids that are in high school right now, um, that they're not going to see the benefits of this um, scientifically proven to be beneficial time change. So, um, and for everyone who spoke here tonight, I promise you that we did get an email from someone asking us please to do this. 
some for health reasons, some for just because they also believe in the science, some elementary parents because they say, fantastic, I'm so glad to be able to put my kid on the bus instead of taking them to daycare, and then they go to school and then um, so I, I promise that they are out there. You might not have heard them. They might not have been quite as vocal, um, but we did get emails and we have had private conversations with them. Um, and I promise you that that support is out there. Um, so I just want to say that while I will support this uh, implementation, um, that it is also a hard decision. And I just want to iterate that this is the type of discussion that the board needs to have and needs to have in public and it always happens in public. You can be assured of that. So here's where I tell you that um, I don't support the later implementation. Um, it's, to me, been always very clear from the first time I heard about it. I am not a data analyst by any means. I don't claim to be a scientist. I claim to be an obsessive person who has literally, and the irony is not lost on me, lost sleep about sleep studies. <laughs> Um, National Sleep Week. It is National Sleep <laughs> Awareness Week this week as well. It's um, when I tell you in my almost six years, this is the most difficult decision we've made. It's the most work we've put into a single issue. That is not an exaggeration. This has been a huge, huge thing. Ask my 11-year-old about sleep studies, and he can tell you because we talk about it all the time. It's gross, really. <laughs> um, so I don't. And maybe I'm just an optimist, and I, I know transportation has told us they can work it out, and I know athletics and activities has worked it out, and I have ultra confidence in our superintendent because I was on the hiring committee, and I think she's the best. Um, so for me, I was <coughs> optimistic and confident that this change could happen, and it would happen this fall. And so I don't support waiting a year. I don't support waiting a year for all the kids who are juniors. And they're probably out there right now going, oh, thank God, we probably aren't going to have to deal with it because we're going to be seniors and graduated before it happens. And so they're like, please don't change what everyone else is saying. I see it with my eyes. But um, I'm telling you that kids don't always know what's best for them, and that's why we have parents. And parents are standing up for their primary kids and saying, we know what's best for our kids. It's incredibly difficult to make decisions for kids who are 4 to 19. It's so hard. But this is a decision that's going to affect every single phase level. And it really crushes me, the kids who are juniors right now, and they're clearly not here, but we have had emails from high school kids thanking us <coughs> for having this discussion that are interested in making this change that have been excited for it and have felt the difference on Wednesdays when they do have extra sleep. It is dramatic and as much as you've talked to people saying that nobody supports it, we've talked to many people who do support it and have said that exact thing. Their kids are different on Wednesdays. High schools had a late start almost every single Wednesday and kids are waking up more naturally on their own. It's, it's very, um, I do not want to vote against the motion because I'm so in support of changing the start times. Um, but I just want it to be said that I think it's perhaps not in the best interest to wait. It's going to be hard whenever we make the change. It's going to be hard in 2017 or 2018. It will be an adjustment period no matter when it happens. I don't think that changes. I don't think it I don't know, maybe it's me being an optimist again. I think we have a fantastic staff and leadership team and the other changes that are at the high school, the NEASC accreditation, is over in November. That's <coughs> done as far as the high school is concerned. That visit is happening in November, so that is no longer on the table for the incredible amount of work that was. And it's in a huge amount of work that's ongoing, has been for years. The schedule, the block schedule change, I'm a huge teacher supporter. Every single time it comes up that there's anything to say about teachers or how we can back them up, I'm always the first one in negotiations to say let's pay them. And so I don't discount your actual true feelings and concerns, but I actually have true feelings and concerns about the health risks 
to our high school students and our middle school students who are not getting adequate sleep. Staying up later may happen, but with a later start time, you're going to get that extra hour. It's just you're not going to set an alarm to goof off on your phone for an hour before school starts. It's just, um, and I don't discount the primary parents' concerns either. I know that every kid has a different sleep schedule. And I just want to say again that listening doesn't equal agreement because we are listening. We are hearing every single person. But we are also listening when there's opponents on either side of an issue. We have to listen to everyone, but we're not going to end up agreeing with everybody. So we are trying to be super duper flexible as much as we can, and we are hoping to be able to crunch the time to get high school, middle school closer to 830, to get um, a couple minutes maybe on the other end for the younger kids, but we can't, I, I've, I don't agree with the change to put it off. I think we've talked about it, talked about it, talked about it, and no matter when we do it, we have to rip a Band-Aid off, but I will not vote against the motion because I think it's such an important issue that I need to put my disappointment aside and say that, okay, well, at least everyone going forward will benefit from it, so. Christine. I just have one thing, um, well, two. Um, I am willing to forego and put it off and allow that transportation audit to come in and for the superintendent to be able to tweak what she has. I do want to mention that there were, at least from my count, and I could be off one, but I think that there were three juniors that did get up and speak, so they will not be the benefactors of that. So I do recognize that there were at least three of you. There might have been a fourth, but that's what I wrote down. So um, thank you, everybody, for coming out, speaking, sending us emails for, against, in between. I can do this. I can't do this. We get it. We, we have not fallen on deaf ears for any of it, but we have to kind of decide for everybody, and it leaves us in a position of that. And I will support um, Jody's amendment and hope that the superintendent once the transportation audit comes back, can find those adjustments. Jody, I just need to be clear because I, I hear a lot of defer and waiting and all of that and sort of drives me crazy. I want to be clear that my amendment to my original first reading approval of option three, what I'm saying is, and I think Carrie said it nicely, is that the decision is being made that this is the right thing to do. We're just giving the time to implement it strategically, correctly, the way that it needs to be done. So it's not a deferment where this is, you know, we've talked about this in years past and we've put it off and nothing's come of it. My amendment is saying, it's not an amendment, it was your motion tonight. My motion tonight yeah. is that the implementation will take longer than what we originally thought. So it will now be implemented in the 2018-19 calendar, not this 2017 calendar. Just making that clear, because I hear a lot of defer and waiting, and that's not the word I would choose. But that seems different than what Jackie's saying then. Those, to me, those aren't this quite the same thing, are they? Yes, my my term deferring it to next year is is simply that that, that the first day of school that would have a different time is next year. That's Stop my understanding. Yeah. Right. And and my aim is for the as I said that the superintendent and her team will have the opportunity to make further recommendations to the board of education through the committee through the policy committee mm -hmm. on what that'll look like. Yes. But there is going to be a change. Yes. That's my understanding. Yes. Point, point of clarification, if you can. Um, so we're approving draft one for this coming school year, mm -hmm. as is. So our current calendar will be the current calendar for August, whatever happens. I don't remember when the date is this year, but August. And then included in that is that option three will be implemented in 2018 school year. The times the of time, option right. three, yes. Okay. I just because want to make sure that both of them are together 
that you were there. So we don't have the second vote. Yes, kind of I will vote. read my motion again, and I will um, even include the times that are here nicely on my paper. Uh, move to approve the 2017-18 school calendar presented as option three and reviewed at the first reading on April 6, 2017, except that the administration is directed to implement the school hours as presented in option three for the 2018-2019 school years. The 2017-18 school year school, school year school hours will remain unchanged from the current calendar. So those times are K through 2, 8.50 to 3.15, 3 through 5, 8.30 to 2.45, um, 6 through 8, 7.45 to 2.10, and 9 to 12, 7.35 to 2 o'clock. It's 8.20 to... Um, 8.20 to 2.40. Yeah. 2.45. It's a 6-hour, 25-minute school day. I have Did made that adjustment. Um, okay. Anybody else? I just want to piggyback one more time on Jody's clarification because I think it's really important to understand. We are voting to change the start times in Scarborough schools tonight, but they will be implemented fully 2018-2019. But that vote is happening tonight. Anybody else? Mary, did you have anything else you want to add? Um, I think I just wanted to say that, you know, I I understand the difficulty in making this decision for, you know, for us as a, as a board, and then I understand the difficulties that um, for parents and staff and um, students, and um, and I know this is it is a huge decision, and when it's a huge decision, then there's you know, going to be a large amount of discussion and debate. And so um, I do definitely agree with um, postponing, and I think having that time to um, really implement it in, in the most, the way that can work for the most people will be helpful. And, uh, and then I think I look forward to really having a lot of discussions with community members and students and staff and to really work on you know, making it making it work for the most people and finding solutions to those problems that, that might we might be facing. So. It's on the bright side. Here's my optimism again. At least now everyone has notice and time to make plans and adjustments. Um, it's plenty of time, I feel like. <laughs> um, but it's um, I think it's the right thing for the district. Anybody else? Okay. All in favor of the adoption of a 2017-18 school calendar? Seven. Thank you. So now we are at 7.0. Uh, motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA Chapter 405-60 for the purpose of discussing the Scarborough bus driver's contract not to return to public session. So moved. Second. Okay, thank you.